Great. I think we're live. We're live, everybody. How's the chat box in there? Hello, hello. Oh, Ross is on. Everyone's on. Thanks, folks. How great. Guys, welcome. Home brewers and craft beer lovers. It's really great to see you. My name's Paul Daly. I'm the craft beer ambassador for Little Creatures, but also a certified Cicerone. Um, before we get started today, I just want to run a couple of housekeeping things that will just make the whole session a whole lot more enjoyable and maybe a little bit less disjointed. Um, there's a couple of logistical things. So to interact with the panel today, there'll be a little Q&A button that you can see. Either if you're looking at an iPad, it might be at the top. If you're on a PC down the bottom. That's how we interact with our brewers and the panelists today. Um, there's four of us speaking. So if you can list the speaker's name when you ask a question, just list that on the Q&A. And that way it does help us direct straight to this, um, the brewer that you want to speak to or even the panelist. Um, there is a chat option too. So that chat option is fantastic for what you guys have been using so far. Tell us what you're drinking. Uh, tell us where you're from. You've all been doing so great to do that, but also interact with your fellow homebrew community out there and, and have a chat and, and see what's going on. But we will be using the Q&A specifically. So Joel's work drinking water. That's fair. <laughs> it's, it's COVID times. You've got to pace yourself. Um, but use the Q&A just for the brewers because that's where we'll be looking to get these things answered. And obviously anything that we don't get to, we will be able to use later on um, with Masterclass number two. So again, welcome to Masterclass number one. Um, let's get started with the, uh, the brewers. So I'll introduce everyone to you. We've got um, who's below me at the moment, but MJ, who I mentioned in the Hyatt Reels, MJ is our innovation brewer from Fremantle. So he'll be here today um, and he'll be talking about that. We've got the great Russ Gosling, uh, who is our head brewer in Fremantle, uh, has been at Creatures for quite some time, uh, 2005, I think, is that, Russ? That's right, yeah, 15 pretty years. Good, pretty bloody good time. And we've got the amazing Ali, I call her Ali Mack, but it's <laughs> Alison McDonald. Um, Ali's been everywhere in brewing. Um, I was looking at her bio earlier, and, and she'll tell you later on, but she's been at Little Creatures in Geelong uh, for five years, uh, but she now works as a lead brewer in the Malt Shovel Brewery in, in Sydney, but the fantastic thing is, not only do we have a wonderful woman on the panel, but she is also the president of Pink Boots Australia, and she has been for the last three years. So um, we've got a fantastic panel, and so throw questions in the Q and A. Have a good chat. These are some. These guys have an absolute wealth of knowledge, um, and hopefully, we'll be answering some of your questions. And and if we don't, we'll, we'll, we will certainly get to them over the coming weeks too. So Little Home Brewers, you would have seen the website and you would have seen a whole lot of information. Why did we dream it up? Well, look at us here. I'm stuck in my kitchen um, and you've seen the hype reels. I'm still stuck in my kitchen. It's getting pretty lonely in here. So we wanted to find ways for people to actually use their time, so this home time, and create some fantastic beers in that and do it in a really lovely collaborative way in a fantastic community. So that's a big reason why I do it. Use that time. And it's close to our hearts, home brew too, um, and beer, so Little Creatures from its beginnings. We want to get people learning new skills. So it's all about collaboration and sharing. So for those brewers who don't want to share their secret beer logs, that's fine. Don't share them. Um, but what we want to do is just get together with a community and share ideas. I think it'd be fantastic. We're going to brew some great new beers. You can stay tuned to the masterclasses. You don't actually have to brew a beer, but if you just want to get amongst the community and meet new people, this is a fantastic format for you to do that. So don't feel that you have to go on and brew a beer. But for those who do want to brew a beer, this is um, a great way to do it. So just by taking that one step further and submitting your beer, we'll be judged by our brewers. Our brewers have some fantastic credentials, whether it's regional um, craft beer judging or craft beer awards or all the way up to the top of the pinnacle of the AIBAs. Our team has experience at every level. So you can understand that what you'll get out of it is your beer judged in a very professional way, um, but also because it's a collaboration. Um, there's always going to be feedback and we'll always share that. So it's not going to be, um, just a set and forget kind of way. Um, if you do win and you come through to our finalists and your beer is judged, the great thing about this, and as you said, the heart will, we'll take you to Fremantle and we'll brew your beer there. So your beer will be brewed by Little Creatures. It'll be available at both the Fremantle Brewery and the Geelong Brewery and available at Fremantle Beer Fest. For those, I'd love to hear if anyone's been to put your hand up if you've been to Fremantle Beer Fest. It is definitely one of my most favourite beer festivals every year. This would have been my, I think this would be my fifth or sixth one in a row. Uh, we do great activations and all the WABA, West Australian Brewing Associ Brewery Association breweries out there put their best foot forward. The sun is shining, you've got Frio, uh, the Frio Harbour there and you've got little creatures there, so it's fantastic. Um, 
and you'll get to share your beer with 12,000 other punters at the bar and have a beer with me and have a beer with Russ and Ali and MJ and the rest of the Creatures team. Plus, it'll be launched at the brewery the night before, which is usually the best one you get to go. Um, but we'll explain the brief a little bit, um, a little bit down the line too um, by Russ and the team. Today, we're going to get into just to set a bit of an agenda, the challenge itself. So I mentioned the challenge, we've seen it in the video. It's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, how you might be going, how you might go about designing a beer and a concept. So there are, I know there's a lot of brewers out there who are brewing off all grain and stainless, but this competition is also open to people who just have a, even if they want a liquid setup, so an extract setup. So in, if anybody wants to ask any questions, the great thing about the community is you can share those and help people who are just starting to realize how great home brewing is. It's by the people, the elders in the industry. Um, my friends in the New South Wales Home Brewers are, um, Association. So, Brendan, if you're there, say hello. Um, can help you along with that one too. We're going to share some tricks of the trade. Um, we'll also open up to a QA and a at the end. So, if we don't get to you, there's some time set aside for that one. Um, make sure you get your questions across the Q&A also. So, please don't forget that. That's important. Um, and also, reach out again. Reach out and say hi, which is fantastic. So, enough of me talking. Let me introduce you to some of our brewers. And we will start at the top. Russ. Say hello and tell us a bit about yourself. Hello. Well, before we start, I just thought we should reflect on your hair, Paul. <laughs> I know there's been some comments. I, I just want to see one of those. Oh, look at that. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. It, is, it is always people who have hair like yours that have the biggest <laughs> issue with my hair, mate. It's, um, it's not one of those things. It's the grey hair. So people are going grey out there. You'll notice that grey hair gets all wiry and that's it. And, yes, it's... Uh, there are, we do have a bit of an issue with barbers, but let's get on to you, Russ. Enough about me. Uh, well, hi, every, hi, everyone. I'm Russ. I'm the head brewer of Little Creatures in Creo. Um, I've got something important to admit, though. I've never actually home brewed. Uh, but I have, I have work brewed for over 20 years now. Um, all our innovations start on a 50 litre home brew kit um, in our brewer's sandpit. So home brewing is really important to how we work at Little Creatures. Um, and every year we always upscale one of the sandpit brews to showcase at the Frio Beer Fest. And we love Frio Beer Fest. It's in this beautiful park opposite the brewery and it's got this really nice community atmosphere. So I think this is an absolutely fantastic competition. Beautiful. Couldn't have said it better myself. And yeah, that 50 litre brew kit is um, something to behold. And especially when it's 40 degrees outside and you're hanging over that thing, or even the, the brew kit upstairs in the brew house. And um, we'll throw over to MJ. So MJ does all our innovation beers and all our limited releases that you guys see nationally and in each state for a little creature. So say hello, MJ, and tell us a little about yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, I'm MJ. I'm the innovation brewer for, for little creatures. Um, yeah, so look, once again, and just to reiterate Russell's comments, I mean, yeah, we're really, really excited about um, this competition. Uh, really excited to see what types of, um, I guess, what types of concepts and recipes and, and beer that will come our way. Um, it's a fantastic opportunity to, I guess, not only to participate in these masterclasses and, 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 and send in your concepts and recipes, but for the winner of the competition, I mean, to get an all expenses paid trip over to Frio, taste your beer at the beer festival, have a tour of the brewery with us. Um, yeah, I think it's it's really, really amazing. And um, and I hope you guys learn something out of this today, have some fun with it. Um, and yeah, and just can't wait to see where this ends up. Mm. No, I definitely share those sentiments. It's fantastic. Um, yeah. We'll throw it at Ali. Ali, say hello. I gave you a bit of a, a workup <laughs> before, but <laughs> our, our great female panellist, tell us a little bit about yourself, where you came from, and um, do you homebrew? I do homebrew. Yes, I do. Um, so hi, everyone. As Paul said, I am actually now an ex-creature. I was at Creatures in Geelong for five years and was there through some massive growth of that site. And I'm now up at um, Malt Shovel as the lead brewer. And as Paul said as well, I'm the president of Pink Boots <coughs> Australia, which is a not-for-profit organisation for women beer professionals. And our aim is to empower through um, women through education. 
Um, and I do homebrew and I'll be talking a bit about my setup a bit later. But um, one, one of the reasons I'm so excited about this whole concept and initiative is because it ticks so many boxes for me of what we love doing as brewers. So there's a challenge um, and it is a challenge to design to a brief, which the guys will go through. It's about being creative, which we absolutely love doing. And it's also collaboration, which is one of our favourite things as well. Mm, I uh, saw some good good comments coming out. Good thumbs up to that on the chat there as I see that coming up. Although I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Q&A. But, Ali, but, yeah, guys, some fantastic experience in there. One um, can be understated, some of these guys. Um, you know, Russ has a fantastic British brewing experience. If you love car scales and you want to know about car scales, he's definitely the man uh, to talk to. I think what was the brewery called? Harvey's Ushers of Throwbridge, Fuller's, Thomas Hardy and... Oh, too many names in there but it, they are all um car scale producing breweries that us has the experience of Matty j the most understated brewer in innovation that i've ever met that's such a lovely guy that he has fantastic traditional german brewing experience and if you want to know a guy who's brewed in bamberg in germany he's the guy you go to so if you love german style beers he's the guy to throw some questions out to and then ali mac she's brewed in some amazing places what i've got down here um was it Five Island Brewing Company, which is now Illawarra Brewing Company, had some experience with Sam Fuss, who mm -hmm. obviously, if anyone knows, is now the head brewer and part owner of Filter Brewing. She's also an ex-creature too. Um, yeah. Yep, Sam out there. I've had um, some good beers with her over the times at beer events, and she'll probably be oh, – she might. She actually made a, a showing up at Freo Beer Fest last year. CB, a cider at Campbelltown, Matilda Bay Brewery in Port Melbourne and Little Creatures, and now she's up over the head of Pink Boots. So, guys, if you do have – shout out if there are any female brewers out there who want to have a chat that Ali will throw those, anything about women in brewing, that's fantastic. We'd really love to, to get some more around that. So that's us. Oh, for me, there's not much to say about me. Certified Cicerone, worked in alcohol for some years. My first little bit of brute beer was the Blue Tongue Brewery up in Warnervale on the Central Coast. I'm uh, familiar with that, working in sales from there. It was a, a damn shame. The, the beer industry was complete. The craft beer industry was completely different back then. Um, but now I get to work with these guys and we have an absolute ball at doing it. So that's us. We're really pumped to be here. Thank every, hopefully everybody is feeling the same there at home, which is fantastic. Good to see the comments and thank you. Yes, I am drinking a little creatures pale ale. Um, only the best and it's super fresh too. Um, encourage again, Keep, keep up with the chat and keep up with the, um, the Q&A. So we're going to jump straight into it. Russ, we're going to start with these, set the scene. Um, what, start, start us off with the brief. Oh, well, to set the scene, so um, look, we're professional brewers. You guys are home brewers. Um, but actually, we're just all brewers trying to make the best beer we can on the kits that we have. And hopefully we can all learn from each other. Um, as I mentioned previously, at Frio, we've got a 50-litre all-grain homebrew kit, which um, some guy in a garage manufactured for us in Sydney. Um, and that's in, in our brewer's sandpit, basically, um, which is where our brewers explore um, and create, play around and learn their craft. Um, it's the heartbeat of uh, our innovations, and they all start there. Um, there are lots of people on the call from seasoned home brewers to novice home brewers to people who are perhaps considering home brewing. Um, and I hope you all get something out of this masterclass. I really do. <clears throat> yeah, and uh, to put that back to some context, I mean, some of the home the home brewers, the, the innovation brewers of Brit out of Sandpit have been fantastic. Um, just to put some context in some of the beers that the, we produced for Fremantle Beer Fest last year, we had a beer that tastes like a Negroni. Um, we've had raspberry wheat beers. We had a, a, a crazy New England IPA a few years ago and everything in between. So when we're talking about, especially the home brews, as we go through the brief too, and what we'll get the information on the website um, and how we create these beers, it doesn't have to, uh, there is a, is there a cure? I'll just put out there for the moderators, the Q&A apparently isn't working, but we'll check on that anyway um, from a comment I see come through there. But uh, they've done some innovate, great innovation brews out there um, that, uh, yeah, so hopefully we will touch on that a little bit more. We've seen that. No. Look, grain fathers are coming through. Yeah, we're good. It looks like the Q&A is back, guys. That's perfect. 
So, all right, so before we get stuck into some brewing tips, um, let's take a look at the challenge because you know that there's a lot, that's what a lot of you are here are for, not just the master classes. There's a fantastic prize. So for those brewing at home, you really want to consider the brief. So the brief is particularly important and make sure that this isn't just a, um, uh, a submit a beer and your beer is judged primarily on that. There is a whole lot of parameters we want to make sure you tick off on that one. So you want to get, to, and particularly, you want to get stuck into designing your concept. So we can't taste every single beer out there. So the concept is really key. And that goes back to say a larger brewery like Little Creatures of how we design a beer um, and bring up a concept. So we need in the market and then we go, so we want to see your thought process behind how you put this beer together. And that is marked out of the 25% just for that concept. And then also there's your ingredients and then the beer itself. So there's a bit of a process to it. And that really helps you along for when when we scale up from home brewing to professional brewing, where we actually look at the market and see where a beer can go. Um, you want to get stuck in design concept. So yeah, whilst um, you do your concept, sourcing your ingredients and brewing your beer. So we had that finished no later than the 18th of June. So you got six weeks to get this sorted. Um, so your concept submitted, and then you and then we'll work through that and get the finalists, and then we submit our beers. Um, you'll need to submit through the website no learn later than the 8th of June. Um, and obviously, we'll, like I guess mentioned, we'll be judging the concepts based on creativity, suitability to the brief. And that's really important, which is what Russell teach, uh, will talk in a moment. And I did mention the brief during the videos. Um, and you can go back and have a look at it. And um, viability for us to produce. So obviously, there's some beers out there that just can't be scaled up to a certain size. You gotta understand we're a 100 hectolitre brewery in Fremantle. Um, so we've got to have the beers that suit that brew kit. So all these little things will distill down and then we'll get our finalists from there. So to become a finalist, um, you've written the concept and a recipe and it'll be just as important as the quality of your beer. So if you wanna know more about the judging quality, we'll just get onto the website uh, or click as a DM if you've got any issues through one of our social media channels and we'll get back to you. Once the finalists have written uh, the briefs, those finalists, finalists will be asked to submit their beers to Western Australia. Um, each of the finalists who sends their beer for taste will receive a case of their favourite little creatures plus some sample supply of hops from our hop supply, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, when the beers do arrive in WA, then the way they get there will communicate with the finalists as they get there. Uh, they'll be chilled and they'll be judged by the team over there in WA. And like I said, these guys are pretty darn experienced in in, in, in beer judging, whether it be at the, the highest level or state and regional levels. Um, each beer will get points for quality of beer, the concept and the recipe. But again, to get your, your foot in the door and overline that first stage, can't reiterate that concept and that creativity. Tell us why you're brewing this beer and what the need is, um, which would be fantastic. So without further ado, let's go back to the brief um, and Russ is going to take us through that. Right, hello. Right, um, so I'm not going to read the brief word for word. Please head to the website. Full details are there on the brief, FAQs, and of course, the all-important TNCs. Um, the brief is intentionally broad. Uh, so there's only really two components. One is the ABV needs to between, be between four and 6%. Um, please, no diastaticus yeasts. If you don't know what that means, head to the website and there's a list of approved yeast strains on there. So get super creative. But remember, your beer needs to work. Um, so if you're considering special ingredients, they need to have purpose and enhance and harmonize the beer. So the weirdest and wackiest out there beer will only win if it's considered and integrated. There's four things I'd like to highlight. This is Fremantle Beer Fest. So we want new and different. That's number one. Number two, it needs to appeal to a broad range of people who are going to attend. Uh, number three, it's going to be poured next to our other little creatures' beers, so it needs to stand up. And four, it's always, I tell you, it's always 40 degrees Celsius, <laughs> so it needs to be refreshing. That's pretty much the brief. 
head to the website and have a look. Perfect, Ross. Thank you so much for that. Sorry, as I uh, take a moment to pour my beer into a glass because I was given a bit of, of, of um, flack online for drinking beer out of a bottle, which is very fair. And I apologise to those guys who appreciate it. I too wouldn't always, we'll always drink beer out of a glass, except for now. Who can miss a perfect marketing opportunity? Thanks so much for that, Russ. Um, there was a question out of that. I'll quickly jump in. What brand is our 50 litre brew kit? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, I, I saw that question come up. I've been trying to find the answer, but I'll have to come back to you on that. I think it was um, custom built by a guy in Sydney in his garage. They knocked out a few um, for the business. So I, I don't, I'm not necessarily sure it's something you can go and purchase um, off the shelf, as it were. I don't think there's anything more home brew than a custom built brew kit. So that's a... Uh, Pretty bloody good. Um, Russ, can you talk about the kind of things we should keep in mind when we're designing a beer and a concept? Okay, so, so how to design a beer concept? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, design, so designing a beer and also, I guess more importantly, designing a concept um, and, a, and a concept to fit that beer. So from yeah, experience. Okay. So fundamentally, you need to know what you want to achieve. So I get two things. The first thing I get is a, a brief from marketing, um, which, which basically outlines what's important to them. And this contains a list of fundamental things like the beer style, um, how they want it presented, any specific ingredients, who the beer's for, um, what's the... You know, what's the point of difference with this beer? All those sorts of things come through on, on what we call a marketing brief. And then secondly, at Creatures, we have something called a brand proposition, which kind of acts as a guideline uh, or, or provides a set of, set of principles to, to, to explain what sort of spaces we should be working in. And that, and that really contains three pillars for us. The first one is uncompromising beer quality. Um, and this goes back to Little Creatures Parallel. So leaf hops, non, not pasteurised and bottle conditioned. So we, we, we don't compromise on, on what we think are the little things that make a difference. The second pillar is inclusivity. So all our venues are inclusive and welcoming to everyone. And so the beers I make need to support that. And thirdly, sustainability. So we always, we're always mindful and consider the, our impact. Um, and we've always had a very close community focus and link. So I take both of those inputs and reflect on them and then shape the actual concept. But once again, I, I'd just like to point out that please remember the, the ingredients that you, that you add should enhance the beer style to produce a really integrated beer. Yeah, exactly right, Russ. I think we need, you know, it can be, it's got to be all inclusive and it's got to hit um, what our pillars are for little creatures and, and suit that. So it's got to fit in with the brand. But I think enough, you know, I, I was talking the other day and I think it can be as, as something as beautiful as a German Pilsner, but it can be something eccentric as a pale ale with a special ingredient. But as long as it fits with what we're drinking beer at Little Creatures on a 40, 40 degree day, that's something that's going to stop. We're literally looking for something that's going to stop someone as they walk past and find that's very interesting. Um, so that's fantastic. There is um, a couple of questions, great questions on the chat that I will get through to in a moment, particularly around uh, some German brewing there, MJ. Mm -hmm. So we're going to we're going to come into you. Um, so we're selecting ingredients from your experience. So. I did mention a couple of beers, and you're going to for IPA, which they're, they've been around for quite a few years now, but that Spice Negroni Ale. So you have got some very good experience of brewing on that little kit and then expanding it up to a bigger production, which there was a question about that too. But with your experience on, on, on all the beers, especially even the beers you brewed for Gabs, um, can you give us some idea on if you were selecting ingredients for your concept, what would you sort of think about? I, I think Russell covered quite a few things there. I think it's... I think then at the end of the day, you want to be quite clear, I guess, of what you're trying to achieve. Um, so if you're, you know, 
if you're making a lighter style of beer, then you would need to suit or, or you know source the malts appropriately to suit that style. So something that's sort of light in colour, maybe a little bit of caramel malt for a bit of extra body, etc. And then I guess you would have to go and think about what type of hops you want to use. So, you know, for example, if you're making a nice sort of German Pilsner or something like that, you might want to select a hop that's, you know, um, has a nice sort of firm bitterness. Um, you also want to consider, I guess, with your hops, um, the differences between flavour, aroma and, and, um, and bittering hops. So probably not, you probably wouldn't use sort of some North American sort of really citrusy type hops in that type of beer. You'll go for something a little bit more traditional, um, probably target some of those more noble European varieties. <clears throat> I did hear a um a Rosh beer. Uh, I don't even know I'm pronouncing that right in the comments. So you wouldn't be you wouldn't be brewing one of those, hey? A, a what? Sorry. Or is it Rosh or Rauch? Rauch beer. That's it. Oh, it's a smoked beer. There you go. It's yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it is, but I'm not. <laughs> I, you wouldn't be we wouldn't be brewing one of those, would we? Well, well, who knows? I mean, if it's um, yeah, I mean the as it stands, the brief is really wide open. I mean. We've set an ABV between four and six percent. Um, we haven't really specified, uh, other than you know, probably not using saison yeast, <laughs> for example, because of their diastatic, uh, diastatic as characteristics. That's really the only parameters we've set thus far. Um, yeah, I mean, a Ralph beer certainly fits in that in that very wide open brief we've got. Oh, well, there you heard it, guys out there. If you're looking for something a little bit smoky and I saw bacon come through, then, hey, surprise us, which might be nice. Um, anything else there in specific ingredients? Maybe anything you've experienced um, from a beer you've brewed on the mini kit from ingredient that surprised you in, say, maybe it's sessionability or that it's actually gone up into being produced in a larger scale? Is there anything you can think of? Um just thinking about a beer I think we made last year for Gab. So we made a, a beer called uh, Eastside Pale Ale for Gab's. Mm. And we used a um, we used some tea in that called Osmanthus. That's a tea that's um, – or, or a plant that's um, native sort of the Southeast Asia. And what the interesting thing about that ingredient was that, um, Again, we, we try and add ingredients that are going to complement the beer. We don't want to add something that's um, that doesn't fit, I guess, into the into the beer. And we we use that ingredient in our sand pit. And what we found was that it really enhanced the the aromatic hop quality of the beer because the the osmanthus leaf had a nice sort of apricot sort of fruity note to it. So instead of um, conflicting, I guess, with our ingredients, it actually complemented them and elevated the beer. So I guess that's a, an example of, of how we've taken a sort of a very non-traditional ingredient. Um, we've tried that in our sand pit. We've tasted it. We've, we, you know, we've done all the analysis. We've done the sensory tasting. Um, and what we found was that it was actually really complementary. So I think that that ingredient um, for that type of beer was, was fantastic. I agree. That was a fantastic beer for Gabs uh, last year on the Little Creature stand. I think it's key for that beer. Amazing, unique ingredient. Um, it enhanced the flavour of the beer, but what also was perfect, the beer, the beer was still in harmony, so it had perfect balance. I do get a lot of beers out there I try, and they have got a unique ingredient that you sort of you go for, especially on the container bar at Gabs, and you, you try it. But it overpowers the beer and it really ruins it. So you end up walking away dis disappointed. And I think that's key for the guys out there, people who are, um, <laughs> yeah, I did I did crack a smile at the Costa comment. I did like that one. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, they, sometimes the balance isn't there. So I think that's key for the guys out there to to work on the balance. If you can, if you can incorporate a fantastically unique ingredient, um, do it. But keep that balance because I want to drink in the Frio sun. I want to drink four schooners of your beer from our hand over your shoulder. And then we can walk, talk on about gardening tips just after that. And it'll be fantastic. So don't worry about that. Um, <clears throat> we're going to work on to walk on to uh, Ali Mac at the next thing, which is great. So Ali, um, some people might be wondering what kind of 
um, home brew kit that they can use at home? Um, what kind of materials that they can use for the challenge? Any home brew setup um, advice from your experience? So I guess there's um, three main types of home brew setup, and that is um, extract, uh, partial or all grain. And really for this challenge, um, as I think you said earlier, Paul, you can use whatever you've got. It does not have to be a full custom built uh, 50 litre system. It can be an extract. It can be an extract system. It can be as small as you can go. Um, so you really can use any setup that you have. <coughs> Um, and the we're not going to be judging the beer based on the quality of your setup. We're going to be judging the beer based on the strength of your concept. And while we want the beer to be brewed as the best as you can do it, um, we're going to be judging the finalists on the beer, the concept and the recipe. So we're not here to make judgments about what your homebrew setup is. And it doesn't matter if you're starting out or if you've got years of experience. This challenge really is for everybody. Yeah, couldn't have said it better. That's fantastic, Ali. Um, I don't know, Ali, Russ might talk to this, but we were talking the other day, and particularly if there is, you know, if you're worried about your beer traveling not well, these guys are experienced, and we can look past small minor details uh, uh, that, that might not get your beer in the best freshness, or if it might take a couple of weeks or anything like that, or if there's a minor fault in there that isn't, we can look past it and we judge it based on other criteria that's going to ensure that your beer has its best foot forward and the opportunity to win. Um, so I'm talking about that, Russ, um, and I have seen some comments that talk about a little bit about this, but how you use the Fremantle Sandpit to revise a recipe, and you can also mention, because there was a, a comment um, how do you scale up from 50 litres and manage to do that with a limited release into the commercial scale that we actually do? So, throw over to you. Uh, good question. Um, this, this is quite simple, really. Basically, we brew, we taste, we brew again, we taste and we brew. Uh, that's really it. So, I'll give you an example. We've just made a, um, a milk stout um, with coconut, cacao, vanilla, and lactose. So we put the recipe together um, and brewed it, but then, then we have to taste and consider whether or not we've got the addition rates right for all of those particular ingredients. So of course, first time around, you never get it quite right. So then you've got to brew again based on your taste of the first one and do some subtle sort of tweaking and then you go again. That's basically what we do. In, in terms of upscaling, actually, quite frankly, what we, what we normally do is put together a 100 hectolitre recipe. And then, um, because ultimately that's, that's the scale that we brew on every day. So we're very familiar with that 100 hectolitre recipe or 10,000 litre re recipe. And we've kind of got a really good, good gut feel on, um, you know, malt masses and um, hot masses and, and kind of any ingredients we're using kind of where they should be. And then from there, we pull it back to create one for the 50 hectolitre sand pit, basically. And then we go from there. Once we've got that right, it's very straightforward then for us to put together the the recipe for the uh, recipe for the big boy. That's it. Simple as that. Uh, who knew? Who knew you could do it that way? Um, Ali, throw it back mm. to you. So, uh, what suggestions, I guess, on this one do you have for those people brewing at home with limited equipment and space? So, I've actually started doing um, five liter brewing. And the reason I started doing that was because um, when I was in Geelong, I was in a house and I actually had lots of room and I started thinking about putting together this grand, almost mini brewery. So I was looking at like what people have been commenting. I was looking at Braumeister, I was looking at Robo Brew, I was looking at 20 litre, 50 litre. And then it kind of started in my head getting a bit out of control because then I was like, oh, I need like a heat exchanger and I'm going to have to get a bar and I'm going to have to get all these kegs and put this full set up. And then suddenly this brewery was bigger than Ben-Hur. So um, somebody suggested to me, why don't you just do five litre brewing? And I was like, that's amazing. So 
I actually, which has worked well because now I'm in an apartment and I would not have had room to bring that whole brewery with me. So with five litre brewing, I literally just use what's in the kitchen. So I use a couple of pots, which one of them's like my pasta pot normally. The other one's like what we use for soup. I use um, like the calandria that we use to drain out pasta. Um, it's really good for when I want to cool down my work because um, the pot just fits straight into the laundry sink and I can cool it down really quickly with like cold water um, and ice bricks. And then um, like the fermenter is quite small and when I need to cool my fermenter after fermentation, it fits into the fridge and doesn't take up too much room. So there is a lot you can do with um, if you are in a limited space or apartment living and there's quite a few resources around for um, small batch brewing. And I really like five litre brewing because you can really experiment with um, unusual ingredients and whatnot and your your malt bill and your hop bills are quite small so it means you can really play around and if there's an expensive ingredient you've always wanted to use it's a great way to use it because you don't need a lot of it incredible i am um, this is leading perfectly into the next conversation which is about cleaning and sanitizing mm. if you've just made a pasta and then you've just mashed in <laughs> How do you make sure that you're on top of your cleaning and sanitising if you're using the same equipment for that one? I don't know if anyone else is thinking about the same thing, but tell us about your cleaning and sanitising techniques in small-scale apartment brewing. Well, cleaning and sanitization <coughs> is important regardless of what scale you're brewing at, whether it's 5 litres or 100 hectolitres. Um, it's so important and there's an old saying that... Um, brewing is 90% cleaning and 10% brewing and it's really true you've just got to take the time to make sure all your um, all your apartments clean no you've got to take the time to make sure all your equipment's cleaned um, and there's such a great range of products now at the home brew, at your like local homebrew shop for cleaning and sanitizing so it's just really important you clean and sanitize all your equipment because you don't want to put all this work into creating this great recipe getting the ingredients, having your brew day, and then your brew being affected by off flavours or whatnot because you haven't cleaned your equipment. And I guess a couple of things to note, you can't sanitise dirty equipment. Your equipment has to be clean and then you can sanitise. And the other important thing, and this is saying I didn't do until I started working in a brewery, is also make sure you use some protective equipment. So what we call PPE. <coughs> so I will always just use like some kitchen gloves and um, my work safety glasses so nothing splashes in my eyes. Um, Cause you just want to look after yourself when you're doing it. And my big tip is don't leave cleaning especially after bottling day, you look at your fermenter and you're done and you don't want to do anything else and you think, I'll clean that the next day. Don't do it. Just clean it that day, get it over and done with, clean up everything at the end of the day. I think what people are really interested to hear from the chat is that you, just to make sure, you are washing your dishes with normal detergent. You don't actually just wash everything with caustic now no, just because no. you might be using it in a brewing, home brewing situation. No, I have my <laughs> brewing cleaning and my kitchen cleaning and that's separate. <laughs> I mean, look, some cleaning products are hard to come by during this time um, with the shelves being empty. True. So caustic might have creeped back in. It could be a good, a good way to bring it in. Um, do you have, for, I guess, for the guys out there with a, a bit more experience um, with home brewing, um, is there any tips you can share on fermentation? Yes. Um, so even for those who don't have a lot of experience, I love fermentation. Um, it's a really interesting um, uh, aspect of brewing which I think is quite often overlooked but it's really important and I was fortunate enough to be able to focus um, at Little Creatures in Geelong on fermentation for six months because that was part of the role I was doing at that time so I learned so much so I guess for me the most important thing about fermentation is to know what conditions your yeast wants because you need to keep your yeast happy so there's lots of information nowadays that you get with your yeast and you can also Google as well because it's going to tell you what temperature that, that that yeast wants to be at. 
And that's really important that you control your temperature during fermentation. So I saw someone in the comments had said they're having trouble controlling their temperature. So even if you don't have like um, heating or cooling, you can, if you know the temperature of the room that your ferment is in and that temperature doesn't fluctuate, you can then actually brew to whatever that temperature is. So I usually like, I don't have temperature control, so I just brew with the season. So I brew uh, lagers in winter and ales in summer. So it's really important to just know what temperature your yeast wants and to try and maintain that temperature and fermentation. And um, the other things to look at um, is, for those of you who are more experienced, something that can really tell you what's going on with your yeast is pH measurements. So often the pH is the early indicator of yeast activity. And that's going to tell you that your fermentation has started. And also at the end of fermentation, while you might be waiting for your gravities to be consistent, pH is going to let you know if your yeast is still healthy or not. So if your pH starts to rise, it means probably your yeast is starting to die off and isn't happy and your fermentation probably has finished. So they're probably my two key things is temperature and pH. Great tips. I've seen some great comments coming through there. People have really seen some value in that in that commentary there. Thanks so much, Ali. Um, we're going to roll over back to MJ now. So what we want to talk about here is just some additional gear or tools that can help you guys go from, say, beginner to a little bit more advanced in your home brewing. So MJ, is there any additional gear or tools that might help get the beer just the way you want? And what might those gear, what, that, what might those assets look like? Yeah, great questions, Paul. Um, I think that I think what's good for brewers is, um, I guess, being able to measure um, your different parameters. I guess when you're brewing. So, I think I'd start with probably some scales. So, I think for the home brewer, um, probably some bathroom scales would be fine to to weigh out. I think your larger um, uh, malt. Uh, grist sort of um, compositions there so one two three four kilo sort of weights I think some bathroom scales will be fine but I think for um, for your for your finer uh, type additions or something more accurate you might want to invest in a um, set of bench top scales so you had to weigh out your hop additions um, um, darker malts you might only want a couple hundred grams off so if you want to try and keep that exact then I'd probably invest in a small set of scales there the other thing, um, I think being able to measure your temperature is key. So investing in a thermometer um, so you can keep an eye on your mash uh, rest temperatures um, because a difference of, of one or two degrees either side of your target can have a real effect on on how dry your beer is or, um, or how much, I guess, residual extract is left over after the end of fermentation. So, so that, that balance between... Um, uh, the balance, I guess, between um, the, the alcohol produced and the um, and the residual extract, it can can really vary um, with with those temperature changes. So that's another one. Another one's a hydrometer. So brewers out there, you want to know your starting gravity. So you, and that's measured in specific gravity for for most home brewer hydrometers. Um, so that will help you keep that under control, and then measuring your gravity um, daily or towards the end of fermentation um, and get some consecutive readings near the end will help you determine whether your fermentation is finished. So that's just a couple of little things that can help. Perfect. That's great, MJ. Um, and some of those things, so especially if we go over the terms of depending, especially if you're just an extract brewer right now, not just an extract brewer right now, but if you are just starting at the beginning, um, and you need some, you need to know some tools. It's going to get you from just a beginner to uh, an, an intermediate, and also all the way up to expert. Throw the questions to the guys, and in the Q and A or the comments, or even throw them onto the Facebook, and then we'll get to them over the coming weeks, uh, which is really good too. Um, if the questions aren't answered here today, uh, we'll definitely get to them next week. And a lot of those questions and what you're what you're looking for will shape masterclass too. And we'll have the panelists on prepared with some of those questions using a broad breadth of experience from Ali with her apartment brewery to uh, to Russ and to MJ. And I think I saw some questions come through about extra special bitters, Russ. And I think I also see some more questions coming through about traditional European style 
beers there too. Um, and Jace, that's really, really good. We're going to throw now, guys. Um, after that, we're going to after um, I'm going to throw now to the Q and A. So come through, come onto the chat, and I'll look at some of the chat. We're going to throw in anything you want coming over to the Brewers. Throw it up on the Q and A now. We've got some guys looking through to um, isolate some of those questions. Um, and as they come through, we'll throw them out to the team so they continue um, on there to the chat. I think I did see one <clears throat> question that if you do live in Fremantle, um, how do you do it? Well, look, if you do live in Fremantle, I'm more than happy for you. We are more than happy for you to stick it in an esky and take it over to the guys themselves. And who knows, you might get to join a pint, join, enjoy a pint out there under the frangipani tree um, and do that too, which would be pretty good. Um, <clears throat> I'll go through a couple other ones. There's a couple for you, MJ. He's come up with a spicy ginger beer. I've come up with a spicy ginger beer. I've won at Beer Fest Melbourne this year. However, I found consistency with the ginger root and chill a challenge, especially when looking to scale up to a thousand litre batch. Um, there's that one there too. I use five kilos per 100 litres of ginger in pros. Uh, would there be pros in lieu of ginger root? Is ginger paste an option? If yes, what sort of ratio? I'll throw this out to the panel too, because I do know that we do have breweries in our network that have used ginger root and have um, Chris Sheehan has had issues with use of ginger root. If that's, I think it was something to do with some um, bacterial issues with that. I don't know if the panel is aware of anything with that one, or that might be something we come back to um, later on. Use ginger flavors a little bit easier too. Um, that might be something we come back to too. So I'll leave that for the panelists. I'll try and find something a little bit easier for you guys. Um, MJ, what are your key tips of brewing a traditional Bavarian Hefeweizen? It's, my, it's, it's, I think it's, it's my white whale, either it's my white whale, but he hasn't, I assume it's um, Dean's white whale and he hasn't nailed it yet. Okay. Um, well, if you want to do a <coughs> traditional Bavarian style, it'll be 50-50 malted wheat and malted barley. Um, but but the key component there is the yeast strain. That's the differentiating factor that will will give you those characteristics of a typical German uh, or Southern German Hefeweizen. Um, I, I mean, you can use 100% barley, but if you use the right yeast, you'll develop those phenolics and those those ester profiles that you're looking for. So yeast is the key in temperature. Yes, in temperature. Um, there's another one to go with that one too. Matt, do you agree with, deco de with decoction mashing with a hef? Decoction mashing. Well, mm. decoction mashing is an old school technique and that was really used back in the day to, to complement under-modified malt. So, and what that means is that um, in the traditional sense, malt was, um, or barley was floor malted. So they were, the, the barley kernels were, were on a, you know, basically in a, in a rectangular hall. Um, they went through their malting process quite unevenly, so it wasn't very homogeneous. Um, so what brewers worked out was if they use a decoction technique, that can help overcome that under-modification of that particular cereal. Now, in, in modern maltings, I mean, the, the malt quality we get these days is, is really homogeneous. It's really well malted. Um, so I think to use decoction mashing today is probably more a philosophical um, element you might want to consider. Um, certainly not necessarily, certainly not necessary, but can add an interesting characteristic to the beer. Mm. Hopefully that answers some of the questions there on hefts. That's great. I will throw over to the other guys there. Maybe Russ, a hot flower is better to use in pellets if available and why, particularly um, you've been at Little Creature since 2005 mm. and we use hop flowers in our pale ale. Yeah, good question. So um, uh, hop flowers or leaf hops, uh, obviously with a traditional uh, hop that was used. Um, and then the hop hops just uh, moved towards pelleted hops, basically just to reduce the bulk density, increase the shelf life, and make it easier from a logistics perspective. We use leaf hops because um, we believe that the, uh, the beer is more delicate and refined um, by using leaf hops, pr predominantly because um, the surface area for extraction of the vegetative 
vegetative material from the leaf is so much lower. So when you use pellet hops uh, and it hydrates, you've got a high surface area for the extraction of some very unwanted vegetative components. So you get a more uh, refined and delicate beer with um, with leaf hops. So I kind of I've described it previously as, a, as using a kind of rock and roll analogy. You know, you use pellet hops, you use pellets in in, in large quantities, and um, you get this kind of raw, kind of green kind of character. It's very punk. It's very it's like it's, it's like the Sex Pistols. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, we've all got a copy of Nevermind the Bollocks, and we bring it out once a year once we've had too much to drink and uh, reminisce on uh, on the old punk days. But using leaf hops is a bit more like the Rolling Stones. It's um, it's, it's still rock and roll, but um, their catalogs uh, a lot bigger, and uh, we all listen to it a lot more frequently. So uh, back in the day when when we designed Pale Ale, we wanted it to be inclusive and, and welcoming to everyone. But at the time, it was the first kind of American pale ale in the market. And so it, it had all the aromatics, but um, was extremely um, sessionable, uh, delicate and balanced and refined on the palate, which is what we're after. I'm, when I make these comments, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with using pellets or anything wrong with using leaf hops. I think, um, I think it's important to use both. I think it's great that there's lots of craft brewers out there making really, uh, really good IPAs that, that have a really big um, pellet character. I think they're fine. I enjoy them as much as anyone else. Uh, but at Little, Little Creatures, we, we decided to, to use leaf hops for, for those reasons, and, um, and we still do today. That's great. Um, <clears throat> hopefully that answered some of your questions about that. I did see a, um, a question on the, on the relates to that. Do you guys actually use um, hot flowers in your beer? So hopefully um, that answered that too. Uh, I've got the next one for Ali. Ali, can you elaborate more on pH in fermentation? What ranges should I look out for throughout the ferment? Um, that is a great question. Um, and basically I'd recommend <laughs> there is like a range for majority beers, but the best thing to do would actually probably be to have a look at, um, the American home brew, no, it's the American style guidelines. Um, cause that actually, uh, goes through like pHs for different styles and whatnot. Um, cause there can be would some. Would that style... be, <clears throat> sorry, did that be the Brewers Association style yes, guidelines? That's or the it, yes. Or not the BJCP? Oh. There might be two. There might be some home brewers on here that have done their BJC, BJ certification program, which mm. is the style guideline set with a part of the American Home Brewers Association. That could be it. Chuck it in the chat if you if you know it's one of the two. BJCP, yeah. David Jarrett. Yep, perfect. Great. Yeah. Um, it's the one, it's something I always refer to um, when I want to understand a style better. So it goes through and actually gives you, um, if you are brewing to a particular style, it gives you the ABV, uh, your gravities and pH guidelines, because there can be some subtle differences um, between different styles. And then that will give you an indication of where you should be with your pH. And obviously sours is a whole other kettle of fish and they've got a whole different pH range as well. I, um, I learned a new thing about sours the other day. What is it? Tri tritatable acid or tritatum? Oh, well, you guys on the line will have to pick me up on that one, but that's a that's another good one for you guys to work out if we're doing sours. Um, Ali <clears throat> or, or the panel, if my yeast has gone to sleep, should I increase the temperature and give the fermentation a stir, a bit of a rousing? Tri there we go, tritatable acidity. Thanks, Patty Donahue. <laughs> um personally i think yeah i'd give it a go because what you've got nothing to lose so you could try and wake it up i wouldn't be increasing the temperature too much i'd be trying to see what temperature i'd be finding out what temperature it would like um and obviously don't open your fermenter just give it a shake from the outside but i'd give it a go because you've got nothing to lose what about repitching? oh yeah well elaborate on that russ repitching how we go about it 
Well, you just had some more years, Taylor. Perfect. There you go. That's all you had to say. <laughs> <laughs> Razz it in and hope for the best. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what about what do I need to watch out for when adding adjuncts like coffee, cacao nibs, etc.? Well, that's a good question. It, it, when we made the coconut uh, stout, we we didn't really know what the right addition rates were. We did some research and we kind of asked a few people and, and um, had a good idea, but it was fairly evident. From the first sandpit brew that we'd actually got the cacao for example far too high um, the beer had this very dry astringent finish um, which actually wasn't particularly pleasant so then then we realized that we had to um, reduce the the addition rate but i don't know i mean all you can do is is um ask some fellow brewers their opinions, brew and taste, and then make any adjustments. But I can't. There's, there's no, you know, there's no textbook or, or, or you know, rule around a lot of these ingredients in terms of addition rates. You, you've just got to do some research, brew a beer, and then make your own mind up as to whether you want more of that character or less of that character, and then go again. Hmm. Um, I want to, I think this is a good one because we haven't touched on this one and it relates to water. Um, we've probably touched on most other ingredients so far, but how much does water quality affect the quality of the beer? Is filtered water enough or would you move to the next level with a reverse osmosis water? I don't know. Um, I think for home brewers, you've got to get rid of the chlorine fundamentally. So you've got to carbon filter it and get rid of the chlorine. Otherwise, you'll end up with uh, chlorophenolics in the beer. Um, it, how fancy you want to go depends on, actually, in reality, probably depends on the, 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 your local water. So, for example, in Perth, our water here pretty much contains nothing apart from sodium chloride. Um, so salt, basically, and, and it's quite, quite low level. So pretty much you've got a blank canvas to throw in whatever salts you want, depending on what you want to brew. But of course, if you're in other areas, um, it is handy to know what your, um, you know, what your local water contains. Uh, obviously for us uh, at Creatures, you know, uh, we use an RO plant. Um, and primarily the reason for that is if you don't remove the chloride to less than 50 ppm, then you get um stainless steel stress stress corrosion cracking so you need to pr protect your vessels and your pipe work but i don't know for home brewing maybe ali's got a bit more of a, a view on, on what you need to do uh i think i agree with you russ i have to admit for my home brewing i don't worry about it too much but i know i should so i i agree with what you've said um yeah you should be getting rid of the chlorine and, um, yeah, ideally using um, something to do that. Uh, we are running low on time, but I did want to throw it out to the guys because the question did come out on the comments before and someone yelled out, <laughs> uh, Paul, Russ, Ali and MJ, what is your favourite or go-to beer style? Well, my favourite beer style is Pilsner. German or Czech? Uh, prefer German. Uh, preferably okay. North German, but Java or something like that. Um, but yeah, Pilsner all the way. Ali? I have two depending on what mood I'm in. So it's either <laughs> <laughs> um, probably my absolute favourite is sour beers. Um, and But I do also like a really good hoppy like IPA or American Pale Ale. So it depends what mood I'm in. What about you, MJ? Oh, it's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, I mean, it really, yeah, as Ali said, it depends what, what sort of mood you're in and, and the occasion, etc. But look, I do like a good Pilsner. Um, yeah, lived in Germany for a bit. So yeah, I'm a big fan of their beers there. Um, and, and variants of, of those bottom fermenting beers, so Keller beer, 
smoked beer, all that sort of stuff. Um, it's all good, but you know, also also a big fan of um, also a big fan of ours. Little creatures pale ale, it's great. Conditioned pale ale, nothing like it. Beautiful American pale ale, are fantastic. Um, mine, I'm I'm not running with the the crowd. I too do love a hoppy German pills now. I do like yeah. a Czech pills too, but I think they're perfect. If I see one at a beer festival or I see one at a, a brewery I haven't gone to, it's the first beer I try at that brewery. I think it's a great sign of quality and care in brewing. Um, and I just think there's nothing like it. You know, they have the same IBUs as an American Pale Ale at times. Um, and there's just, I don't think there's anything you can beat. But I have to say, there is another style that I love so much and I find there's some great breweries to do it. And that's red IPAs or American Ambers. I think there's nothing more beautiful than Pacific Northwest hops with, you know, that nice caramel toffee characteristic that they, they play against each other. I think they're beautiful. Um, red IPAs are, are, are definitely my go-to, um, which is fantastic. Guys, look, I could talk for hours with all of you panellists on there, but this is an hour and this is the first one we've got. So we're all going to have to to roll it up. It's good to mention that um, we'd love you to share your brewing experiences via social media. So that's either by Facebook or by um, Instagram and a like, by tagging Little Creatures, uh, the brewery, but also using the hashtag Little Home Brewers. Um, what that will allow us to do is is basically interact with you a lot more, but also allow you guys to interact with each other as well. Please send through your questions. Use the DMs on both of those platforms to send questions through. Also, if you hashtag your post and you post a question with whatever you put up there, we'll be able to find that and formulate that. We want Masterclass 2 to be built out of what we've what we've laid out here, but really driven by you and your questions. So thank you so much. Again, before we go, thank you so much for being a part of uh, Little Creatures, Little Home Brewers. Thanks for <laughs> listening to me. Um, thanks for the comments. It's fantastic. It's an honour to be called Costa because I actually watch Garden Australia and I love it. <laughs> 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 these guys, I have so much information on these guys that would... Um, I'm sure you would find interesting too. So come along to Masterclass to let's have another beer together and throw it all out there. But until then, cheers, folks. And I can't wait to interact with you during the week. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. See you guys. Bye. Bye.